2 Samuel 10, 1 Chronicles 19, and Psalm 20. Well, this text, and I'll include 2 Samuel 8 and 9, is setting up the reader for the ultimate roller coaster ride, which is David. This text is like that slow clack, 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 clack uh, going uphill as we prepare for what's to come. Uh, to us, it sounds like history as we are now hearing Psalm 105 at the end of the psalm. Remember the promise of Abraham coming true that God is giving the Israelite, the lands of the Goyim. But to a Jew, this is a thousand year promise in the making. And it's a dream come true, literally, that a man, Abraham, who wasn't even from this area, has come over as one family and now will control the entire area by the time our text is done. In fact, let me summarize how I would uh, explain 2 Samuel 10. In a series of brutal military campaigns and elegant diplomatic initiatives, David turned a ragged coalition of feuding tribes into an empire expanding the borders of the nation to what Saul could never have imagined. We're going to, we're going to hear phrases like this in 2 Samuel 8, 6. The Lord preserved David wherever he went. Uh, eight thirteen. David made a name for himself. Eight fifteen. So David reigned over all Israel, and he administered judgment and justice to all his people. He established law and order is how we could say it. Well, here's how he did it. In 8, 1... He defeats, or at least he controls, the Philistines. We really never hear of Philistine oppression during David's reign, nor Solomon's. And so it seems that David has pushed Philistine interests all the way out to the coast. And again, we never really hear from them again. That's in 8.1. Uh, in 8.2, David wins a battle against Moab. Um, this is a, well... There's no other way to define it, I would say, except to say it was psychologically and needlessly cruel the way he wins this war. He takes the losing uh, army uh, members from Moab, he puts them in lines. He sets them up in lines, and then he counts them off by three. One, two, three, one, two, three. Every third line he sends home. Congratulations, go home to your wife and children. Then he kills the first and second line. Of each. It's just an, a way of establishing who's king, shall we say, but in a very needlessly cruel way. Again, David's reigning from Jerusalem right here. In 814, we hear that he puts garrisons in Edom, again showing his control of that area. In 1014, after his ambassadors were embarrassed at a funeral in Ammon, he sends troops over and uh, defeats Ammon in a battle. In 1018, he has a battle at a city called Helam, and he defeats the uh, the country or the um, area of Syria up there. So you can even see on a map, and it seems to be almost maybe not swift in the sense of time, but within these three chapters, we have David just pushing his way both well west with Philistia, south of course, east and now even north. Uh, providentially during this time, we also hear that historically, Egypt to the south and uh, Mesopotamian powers to the north and east are rather weak. So they don't stop David from, from doing this at all. Uh, what else can we say then about David in conclusion? Well, he's a man uh, who's out of town a lot, right? He's doing his work in, in military campaigns. He's not a builder at home. In fact, uh, his palace, which has been discovered, is a rather small one. Uh, his city, the city of David, when we go over there, we have our travelers hold their breath as they walk across the entire city of David because it's that small. It's not a large city. Uh, major building projects will be really given to the next king, and that, of course, will be Solomon as he has the interest of building a temple. Well, is there a problem to come? And I... As, as we close this, I would recommend not romanticizing this situation too much because, yes, we have found now that um, the promise of Abraham has come true. But let's think through this. Uh, David has said in one of his uh, psalms, O oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good. Now that's very true. That's true for the Yahwist. 
But how does that sound in the mind of the Goyim, whom David has not just subjugated, but in some sense uh, embarrassed? Mm 